Good afternoon. Welcome back. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about emerging viruses. What is an emerging virus? A causative agent of a new or previously unrecognized infection. This term was coined in the 90s by Steve Morse, a epidemiologist up at the Medical Center of Columbia. But of course, emerging viruses are not new. They've been emerging for many, many years. And we like to say for humans, since the rise of agriculture, 11,000 so years ago, we think this is when more viruses and other agents started infecting humans because only with agriculture could populations expand sustainably, right? Before that, we couldn't feed a lot of people who were living together. So we existed as hunter-gatherers in bands of a few hundred individuals who lived in, in various places, not in, in towns even. Uh, and it was more difficult for viruses to spread among those. But agriculture made it possible to feed large numbers of people. Uh, and uh, so since then, viruses emerged into humans. Uh, but recently, we've gotten really good at detecting emerging viruses. And so some more detailed uh, definitions and uh, examples. So uh, first, an emerging virus could be a virus with expanded host range that we didn't see before. Um, and so, for example, Zika virus had been around since 1947, and suddenly in 2015 it came to Brazil. We hadn't seen it there before, and it was causing microcephaly, which we hadn't seen before. So that's an emerging virus for Brazil, but we knew about the virus. So it doesn't have to be a new virus. Uh, or it can be a new virus, transmission of a virus from a wild or domesticated animal to humans. That we call a zoonosis. And so wild animals like bats, domesticated animals, cows, pigs, and so forth can all move viruses to humans. And sometimes this, this spillover, as we call it, from a non-human animal to a human, sometimes that leads to the establishment of a new human virus. So it, it changes sufficiently or it's already adapted to be able to transmit among humans. So SARS-CoV-2 came from bats, to humans, and then boom, it, it started transmitting among humans. It's now a human virus. So we don't call it a zoonosis any longer, but the original spillover was SIV went from chimps to humans to establish HIV, and that became a human virus. So sometimes this zoonotic event establishes a new human virus, but sometimes transmission in humans can't be sustained. So Ebola virus going from bats to humans Every spillover makes a little outbreak and then it fizzles out. And then the next outbreak is a new spillover. Uh, MERS coronavirus from camels to humans is the same thing. In fact, West Nile virus going from birds to humans via mosquitoes, every human infection is a zoonotic spillover because you cannot, the mosquitoes can't get enough virus from humans to spread it to another human. So the amount of virus in the blood isn't great enough. So it's amazing, right? Every um, West Nile infection is a new zoonotic event. And, and Lassa virus, which was described in this book, Fever, that I've told you about before, uh, this is mainly in Africa. The, ro the uh, reservoir for the virus is a rodent. And when rodents go into people's homes, they contaminate the home with virus through uh, excreta. And every human case is a spillover from rodents. It doesn't transmit well among humans. So it's a little difficult to wrap your head around that, but that is often the case. So here's an interesting graph showing you uh, what we know about ancestral origins of human pathogens. So first, 31 viruses belonging to the number of genera here on the y-axis. So 31 viruses belonging to 31 genera. So it's, not, it's probably more than 31 viruses, right? Because genera have many viruses in them. These are now human viruses that originally spilled over from some non-human animal. Then 30 viruses belonging to 37 genera are spillovers, zoonotic events. Each human outbreak is a zoonotic event, like an Ebola virus outbreak is a new zoonotic event. West Nile virus, MERS coronavirus, uh, Nipah, Hendra, many more. 16 genera, six, viruses in 16 genera that infect humans 
are believed to have been inherited uh, via the ancestors of Homo species, you know, the Australopithecines and so forth. They passed it uh, down to uh, Homo sapiens, for example. And then viruses in six genera we got from other Homo species like Neanderthalensis and Denisovans. They uh, coexisted at the same time for a period anyway, and so we got their viruses. So our viruses, bless you, came from different animals, not just non-human animals, but uh, humans and hominins. Of course, what's driving this spillover is population growth. I already gave you a hint of that saying, you know, when we went from hunter gatherers to living in bigger groups of people, we started to get more infections and population growth is astounding, right? Look at this over the past 2000 years. Um, we are occupying every corner of the planet. We are invading areas that are full of wildlife and we get their viruses. Uh, and that is really, and not just us invading ecosystems, but changing them as well. We are fooling around with every ecosystem and messing it up. We're screwing up the earth for sure. It's really too bad. You know, we can do great things, but in the name of profit, we don't take care of the planet. And many activities that we do promote virus emergence. And these, most of these are relatively new. The air, look at the air travel. That's a snapshot from a website showing every airplane in the air at a certain time. I mean, this obviously can bring viruses all over the place, um, making dams, irrigation, deforestation, as we will hear today, moving wildlife around, uh, long distance transport of livestock and birds, moving pigs around brings influenza viruses to different places. So that's been really cur curtailed globally. Birds too, you know, exotic birds that are illegal are caught and then shipped to other countries for sale. They have viruses and they may often uh, cause infections. Of course, blood transfusions, transplantation of organs from different animals, like putting a pig valve into humans to replace a valve. Pigs have a lot of retroviruses in them. Uh, they're called PERVs, by the way, porcine endogenous retroviruses. And we wonder if giving people those tissues could be a problem long term. People are actually trying to make pigs that have no endogenous retroviruses in them. Um, just knock out one at a time. So uh, daycare centers is one of my favorites. I, there were no gate daycare centers when I grew up, for sure. And now suddenly we throw lots of kids in there and they swap their viruses and bring them home to their parents. Hot tubs, air conditioning towers, used tires, as I've told you before. But let's not forget climate change. The warming is causing animals to migrate. It's causing mosquitoes to migrate further and further north. And natural disasters often cause uh, wildlife rerouting as well. So just as an example of how many viruses out there, this is the Amazon North region of Brazil, which as you know, is being deforested at a huge rate per day. So people are going in and physically deforest things. And so they're encountering viruses and all these words that you, you can't read and you don't need to are different viruses that have been identified in, the, in this Amazon North region. Uh, and some of them have been cultured at the Chagas Institute as well. So there's a lot of potential for people going into these areas to uh, get infected with more viruses. So today we're gonna talk about uh, a handful of viruses and try to understand the factors that led to their emergence. And this is a list of variety of viruses that have emerged over the years and the factors that lead to their emergence. So for example, I'll just go through a few of these. We're gonna cover some of them. Uh, Ebola virus is bushmeat hunting. In many parts of the world, you can't go to a supermarket to buy meat. You go in the forest and you capture it. So it's called bushmeat hunting. And you can, you can get bats or if you're lucky, chimpanzees, whatever you can get. And that, the bat and the chimp bushmeat hunting uh, causes Ebola virus spill over into people. HIV, as we'll see next time, also bushmeat trade. Influenza viruses come from aquatic birds and also pigs and maybe in the future dogs. Um, West Nile virus there, mosquito transmission and global travel. A mosquito probably came from Israel uh, to the US and brought 
West Nile virus uh, with us. And then we have the latest one, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the risk factor there are the open air meat markets, same risk factor as for SARS-1. There's no question that that virus came from an open air meat market, no matter what you might hear. And we'll talk about that in detail next time, because uh, next time, uh, Monday, we're gonna compare HIV and SARS-CoV-2 in one lecture. So the ability of viruses to jump hosts is based on evolution and principles that we've talked about. Uh, the quasi-species represents the, div the genomic diversity of viruses in each host. So each of these hosts harbors its own set of viruses and they all exist as quasi-species, huge numbers of mutants, one of which may be perfect to infect the human just by chance. Uh, and then if should that virus get into a human, it may be selected for among all the other viruses there and propagate onward if it's, it's able to do so, or if it can't, it will just cause uh, a few infections. So the, the uh, mutational spectrum of viruses is really important, important for the properties that we're gonna talk about today. So before we go into some examples, I wanna talk about the general principles of host virus interactions that govern spillovers into different species. And so this, this image I like, it shows the different kinds of host virus interactions. So we have what we first call, we have four different interactions, right? So this is virus host interactions. First, a stable interaction, which means the virus and the host have been together for many years. SARS-CoV-2 in humans is already stable. It's a couple of years, so I would call that a stable uh, relationship, and that's for all of these situations, that's, a stable relationship maintains the virus in, in the ecosystem. The evolving uh, virus-host interaction it occurs when a virus, say from a stable interaction, goes into a naive population. So a virus in a bat is in a stable interaction, and then the bat gives its virus to a human, and in the human it becomes an evolving interaction. The humans have no immunity to the virus, so there's rapid evolution, at least uh, initially. And that could be the same host or it could be a different host. And we have dead end, this is very, very tricky nomenclature. We have dead end and resistant host. So a resistant host, the virus doesn't even reproduce in it. All right, infection is blocked for many reasons, susceptibility, permissivity, but a dead end host, the virus gets in and reproduces, but it doesn't transmit, it doesn't set up chains of infections. All right, so that's the difference. In a dead end host, the virus is getting into cells and multiplying and maybe being transmitted minimally, uh, but eventually it doesn't maintain, say, human transmission, it doesn't become a human virus. So stable, a few more words on each of these interactions. Stable host virus interactions. Both participants coexist. Some of these are permanent, like for us humans, measles virus, the herpes viruses, uh, smallpox when it was here, it's been eradicated of course. These are stable human virus interactions. Uh, and sometimes more than one species is involved in that. So influenza viruses with other chickens and birds and pigs, for example, and humans, uh, the flavies, uh, all kinds of, of hosts besides humans, mosquitoes, uh, non-human primates, and the same for toga viruses. So that's the stable uh, interaction. The evolving one, again, when a virus from a stable interaction spills over into a different host, it's, or in the same host. So we'll see an example of that when we have viruses that have evolved in Europe before the Europeans came to the Americas, and then they come across the Atlantic, they bring viruses with them. The Native Americans have never seen those viruses. So it's now spill over into a new population of the same species. So that can also be an evolving infection. It doesn't have to be a different species. What can happen? It could, nothing. It could be an asymptomatic benign infection. It could be a lot of death. And for example, uh, when colonists came from Europe, they brought smallpox and measles viruses with them because those had originated, as we'll see, in Europe uh, and they weren't in the Americas. So the colonists brought them with them and they wiped out millions of people because they had no immunity to it. 
Uh, another example, West Nile coming to the Western Hemisphere in 1999. We had not had that virus. It was existing in, in Africa, and it just never made it to the Western Hemisphere, and then suddenly it did, and it spread unchecked across the US. And then finally, introduction of myxoma virus. This is a thing we did as humans on purpose to try and eliminate the rabbits. And initially it did, but not all of them. And uh, so that never solved that problem. Dead end interactions, again, the virus will get in and multiply, but not establish long chains of transmission. No sustained transmission from the new host to others. And Ebola viruses, the reservoir we think is bats, but the dead end hosts are humans, chimps, and gorillas. Influenza H5N1 virus, the uh, hosts are birds. The uh, reservoir is birds, they spill over into humans uh, and don't set up chains of transmission. And so many more examples. So they have really little um, impact on the natural ecology of these viruses. The natural host is where all the action is, and these spillovers really don't mean anything to those viruses. And here's some examples of stable and dead-end uh, host virus relationships. Here is one where there's a stable host virus uh, interaction between a virus vectored by mosquitoes among wild birds. So you can see the mosquito takes a blood meal on one bird and then bites a second bird, uh, and that happens in a continuous cycle. Sometimes the mosquitoes can involve chickens. Uh, other mosquitoes, other mosquito species can even bite the birds and transfer the viruses to other species, but this is a stable cycle that's going on continuously. And often the birds are not affected by these viruses. They've been infected for so many years that they've reached some kind of equilibrium, at least we think so. But periodically mosquitoes will bite dead-end hosts like horses or humans, and the virus will reproduce in them. It can make them sick, but it will not transmit to others because the only way it would be transmitted would be via a mosquito bite, and a, there's not enough virus in the blood to transmit to a new host. So those are dead-end host virus relationships. The virus is multiplying, but it's not transmitting. Here's another one. It just happens to involve a tick instead of a mosquito. So ticks take blood meals on animals as well. Here we have a cycle where ticks are bringing viruses among rodents. Uh, and then occasionally they will bite accidental hosts, humans, or cows. And these are dead-end hosts. The virus doesn't transmit from them, although the cow can transmit the virus to humans uh, through the milk. Okay, so now when we talk about emerging infections, the set one going from, let's simplify it, non-human animals to humans. We've talked about the role of quasi-species and genetic diversity. So somewhere in a host somewhere, there's a virus that could infect a human, has the perfect genome to infect a human. Of course, if that bat never encounters a human, it's irrelevant, right? You know, if a bat sheds virus in the forest, will anyone care? No, <laughs> because there's no human around. But if we do encounter that, which has happened a few times, then we can have dissemination within the humans. You can imagine a scenario. A farmer goes into a cave to harvest guano. Bat shit, right? They use it as fertilizer. The guano is full of viruses. So the farmer contaminates him or herself, gets infected, goes home, contaminates his family. They go to market. More and more people get infected. You get the picture, right? You need that initial encounter. And then uh, the viruses may die in that first health. They may never reproduce in the first host, and we never see them. <clears throat> so there are lots of encounters of viruses with new hosts. We'll see next time that uh, you know HIV-1 came from four independent spillovers of a chimp virus from chimps or gorillas into humans. Four independent spillovers, but they probably are happening all the time and they never go anywhere. For, for us, uh, lucky for us. Uh, and these, these infections may not be transmitted among hosts for many reasons. There's not enough virus. This, the virus isn't the right genotype in order to uh, transmit. 
And of course, when a virus enters a new host, it has to have access to susceptible and permissive cells. Population density is really important for the onward transmission. You have to have large numbers of people, as we'll see with HIV, the, con the European coloniz colonization of Africa played a huge role in this uh, dissemination of HIV, the establishment of big population centers. Uh, and then you need serial infections, human to human. As we will see for SARS-1, we didn't get those very long, but obviously we've got them for SARS-CoV-2. So let's take a look at a couple of origin stories just to give you a flavor of that, how this works. The first is smallpox virus, the only uh, human virus that we have eradicated. Uh, we have sequenced a lot of smallpox virus genomes, not just from humans, but from different species. And when you do phylogenetic analysis uh, of those, it looks like the virus emerged a few thousand years ago in East Africa. Uh, so, um, there, there is East Africa there on, on the right-hand side of the continent. Uh, and it, the idea is that it came from camels. Uh, so how did that work? Camels actually originated in the Americas and they migrated to South America and uh, to, to well, actually to Eurasia uh, via the land bridge that existed for a period of time. And they eventually uh, made their way to the, the Middle East. And the idea is that they acquired, they, these were introduced to Africa 3,500 to 4,500 years ago. And we think the camels got infected uh, with a smallpox ancestor from gerbils. That's a gerbil right there. And then um, the gerbils gave it to humans. So we can tell this by sequencing the genomes of viruses from gerbils and camels and humans and implying this. So again, migration of animals contributes to these kinds of spillovers. Measles virus is another interesting story. It seems to have come from a cow version of measles virus called rinderpest virus. This is a virus that causes disease in cows. And you know, at, at one point, we realized, oh, cows are useful. We can not only drink their milk, but we can eat them. So we started capturing them and growing them in, in fenced in areas. Uh, and then as we got more and more of them and we were next to them and uh, taking care of them or taking milk and so forth, we got their viruses. And so we think uh, this, this began to infect humans. This rin rinderpest began to infect humans when we domesticated cattle. Uh, and then uh, as, as populations grew in the Middle East, uh, the virus became established. You need quite a few people in, in one area, uh, between a quarter of a million and half a million people in order to sustain uh, measles virus transmission. It doesn't work well in hunter-gatherer bands of 100 to 200. Well, they don't even have cows to begin with, so it didn't happen. This is another example of how agriculture has uh, spurred this uh, infection. Yeah. Are humans susceptible to rinder pest? Are humans susceptible to rinder pest? I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. Because they had to have been originally, right, for it to, to spill over. Let's ask Dr. Google. It can infect humans, but does not cause disease. That's from a journal article uh, from the Journal of Virology. So I trust it. Okay. There are two kinds of knowledge, the kind you carry in your head and the kind you have to look up, and both can be useful. A, a faculty member at uh, somewhere in New Orleans told me that once. Anyway, then, so it emerged, measles virus emerged in the Middle East. It spread throughout Africa and Europe, and then it came to uh, the New World and, and with, the, with the colonizers and explorers, and. Native Americans had no antibodies because the virus didn't emerge in North America. I mean, certainly other viruses emerged in North America that were different from in Europe, but no measles and so no smallpox. And so as soon as you introduce that in, it uh, spreads quite rapidly. And so th that leads us to these diseases of colonization and exploration. It's a great example of how, what can happen when a virus enters an immunologically naive population. This is exactly what happened with SARS-CoV-2, right? It spills over initially, 
in Wuhan in a open market where they're selling animals, live animals to be you know, butchered and you take home and you eat them. Uh, and it started to spread among people. Wuhan is a city of 10 to 15 million people, right? Enough people, big transportation hub. So perfect environment for spread. If it had been a smaller city, it might not have worked. So smallpox, as I said, uh, with the gerbils reached Europe in, in 710, caused lots of epidemics, 30% mortality. Uh, and then it was brought over to the new world uh, by the ex explorers like Cortez. Three and a half million Aztecs were killed in two years by smallpox brought in by the explorers. I mean, you know, Cortez had a little band of soldiers. There's no way he could have conquered the Aztecs. He did so because the viruses he brought in uh, killed so many people. And so there must have been some asymptomatically infected people or even symptomatically infected people in Cortez's uh, army that had been incubating the virus on the journey across the Atlantic. And so it spread to uh, the native populations. So poliovirus is a good example of how changing environments can affect uh, the pattern of infection, not, not, a, not whether it spills over into people. We have seen examples of poliomyelitis, a paralytic disease in the historical literature for thousands of years. So that carving is from 1500 BCE. It's an Egyptian carving showing a priest with what we call a drop foot. So poliovirus paralyzes the muscles that control movement of, of your limbs. And when they're paralyzed, you cannot hold your ankle up, right? Normally we can hold our foot up because we can control the muscles, but if the muscle's paralyzed, the foot drops. And so that's a classic sign of polio. And you can see also the calf is atrophied because you're not using the muscles, so it, it loses mass. So we think this is polio, but you know, it could have been something else. But there are lots of examples of polio over the years since this, but there are never any epidemics. There are only a case here, a case here. Throughout the world, you can see uh, examples of this in the literature. So this was in a stable host virus relationship in humans. We don't know where it came from. It must have spilled over from some animal, right? But we don't know which animal. It could have been a mouse or something else, but no idea. Around 1900, though, we suddenly saw epidemics. There's actually one uh, around 1894 in Sweden, I think. And then after 1900, bigger and bigger outbreaks in the US and many other countries. And, and you see a lot of cases, that 1915, 1916 outbreak there, 28,000 cases, that was just the Northeast of the US, 16,000 cases in New York. So what happened here? Why did suddenly we see the change in epidemiology? So this qualifies as an emerging infection, right? It has a different pattern now. It's gone from sporadic to epidemic. So that's an emerging disease. Why is it? Well, we call it a disease, bless you, of modern sanitation. Before 1900, there were no toilets and no sewers anywhere. You used to keep a chamber pot in your bedroom at night and use that to go to the bathroom. Then in the morning, you'd, you'd dump it out. You could dump it onto the street in front of your house in cities. Yeah, people did that kind of stuff. And so viruses, fecally transmitted viruses were everywhere. And so kids, when they were born, were immediately infected with polio virus. But they were protected by their mother's antibodies that were crossed to the baby uh, across the placenta. So that we, the baby gets the mother's immunological experience and that protects them from getting a severe disease. They probably get infected and they make their own immunity as, as when they're about six months or so, but uh, they don't get poliomyelitis. So these, all these kids are being infected early, they're protected, and then if they're infected subsequently, they develop their own antibody T cell response and no polio, at least no epidemics. We see sporadic cases here and there because immunity is never 100%. So what happens in 1900? The toilet and sewers are invented in 1900. The greatest invention of humanity, really. It made us able to get rid of these uh, infections, at least for a while. So what happens now? Kids are born. They're not immediately infected. 
In fact, they're not infected until after their mother's antibodies go away. A couple of years later, you have these big collections of susceptible kids. Now when the virus enters them, boom, you have an epidemic. So that is why we call it a disease of modern sanitation. I was describing this to a journalist once, and he said, I thought sanitation was good. <laughs> it is good. I'm sorry to look at you, but you're a journalist. Uh, it is good, but in this case, it delayed infection. We just didn't know that. But I love to give this example. If we had genome sequencing in 1908, we didn't, we didn't have it till the 80s. Someone would have sequenced the non-epidemic polio and the epidemic polio virus genome and said, oh look, there are 50 differences. Those must control epidemic spread, right? Because that's what we do now. We sequence left and right and we see differences. And I'm gonna pick on the genomicists because they go, oh, this change is responsible for this property. No, you can't say that. You have to do an experiment to say that this change is responsible for this property. It's not good enough to have an association. And that's what they would have done. But the real answer was a little trickier to get at. So my, my lesson for you is don't take the easy road. You know, think about the problem and, and make sure that your answer is, is, uh, not, is not right in front of you. So polio became an emerging virus uh, in the early 1900s by causing these epidemics. And that's why eventually we developed two vaccines for polio because all these tens of thousands of kids, hundreds of thousands globally were getting uh, infected. And this was really unacceptable because many of them had lifelong uh, disabilities. All right, another interesting virus is one that was first seen to cause a disease called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome in the Four Corners uh, area of New Mexico, 1993. So, you know, we have four states uh, in the U.S. that come together there to, to form the four, what's called the Four Corners. And in that area, there was suddenly an outbreak of severe respiratory disease in otherwise healthy young people. So the CDC went in and they isolated virus from them. It turned out to be uh, a hantavirus, which is a member of the Bunyaviridae. It is an envelope virus with uh, an ambisense uh, RNA genome in three segments. So the, the name of this virus is Sin Nombre, right? No name. Do I have that right? Do you know why they call it Sin Nombre? Well, first they called it Muerto Canyon virus because that's where the little town where uh, the first cases were. And the people who live in Muerto Canyon, that means death, right? Death Canyon. They said, no, we don't want a virus named after our town. It'll keep people from coming here. Then they tried something else and they said no. So finally the CDC in a rare display of a sense of humor decided to call it Sin Nombre. And that's, that's what's stuck, because some people don't want viruses named after them. Ebola virus is named after the Ebola River. I guess nobody lives there, so nobody objected to it. Okay, so uh, C. nombre virus. Why did it suddenly, in 1993, start causing uh, these cases of severe uh, respiratory disease? So uh, the epidemiologists went to work. It turns out that there was a lot of rainfall in the year leading up to this outbreak. And with the increased rainfall, there were a lot of pignon nuts that grew. Pignon nuts are delicious. Uh, humans love them, so do mice, and in particular deer mice, uh, which are very numerous in this area. And so the deer mouse population increased because there was more food for them. That increase in population made it more likely that the mice would invade people's homes and they did, and the virus is excreted in uh, mouse feces, as you can see. And you know, if you if you you know, and after a few hours after a mouse has defecated, the feces become dried out because they're very small, uh, and they become dry. And then you go to brush them up, and you're actually um, making an aerosol of dust, and you can inhale the virus from them. And so that's how individuals got this uh, infection. So it's a spillover. It doesn't go from human to human. It goes from deer mouse to human. There's no sustained human to human uh, transmission. The natural host for the virus is the deer mouse. It's not us. And then after we identified it, we could find cases of uh, respiratory disease going back to 1959. 
Um, so here are the numbers in the US since then through 2019, 816 reported cases, uh, mostly in, in Western states, you know, they have the most cases. We have sporadic ones here. You see New York State has five cases. Um, and that's on the right in green is the range of the, the deer mouse whose name is Paramiscus maniculatus. So you see very much of the US and Canada. Um, so this is uh, an a infection that we keep track of. In addition to the deer mouse, some other rodents, the white-footed mouse, the rice rat, and the cotton rat are also hosts for this virus. And so should you worry? Okay, so if you see uh, mouse poop, you can have this virus here. 30% of wild mice that you catch are positive for this virus. So uh, if you see mouse poop, Resist the temptation to just brush it up. You should put bleach on it first to inactivate the virus and then, then take it up. Uh, the other thing is if you go camping uh, and you know those wooden platforms in some campsites that you put your tent on top of so you don't have to sleep on the ground, right? The mice like to nest under it. And there have been cases associated with campers upstate New York, mice are underneath and, and somehow the virus gets into the tent. And also in California, uh, I think, um, uh, what's that national park? Uh, what's the one with the, the, the half dome? What's the one with half dome? Yosemite, Yosemite yes, thank you. Uh, it's uh, in that one as well. It's not a lot of cases, but you don't want to get it because it makes you very sick. Okay, so that's uh, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. Now, bats. Let's talk about viruses in bats. We didn't know bats had a lot of viruses in them until um, 1995 when suddenly there were a few new outbreaks of diseases where the bat was clearly uh, the host. And that is a flying fox, which is one of the largest bats, has wingspans of three to four feet, really, really beautiful animal, right? Looks just like a fox and um, has lots of viruses in it. It is a, a bat that eats fruit. So bats can eat fruit or they can eat insects, two different kinds of bats, insectivorous or frugivorous bats. This is a frugivorous bat. And um, since then, people have studied bats extensively, and we find that they have a lot of viruses in them. Why? So why do they, and why are they an issue? Well, first of all, they're the only mammals that fly, right? Uh, birds are not mammals, right? And uh, they, um, they, what's the other part? They are the only mammals that fly. Oh, and they're 20% of mammals are bats. But just as a side, 40% of mammals are rodents. So rodents are another source, as I've told you, for C. nombre. And when, they fl when bats fly, they generate a lot of oxygen radicals, right, that burn energy during flight. And their immune systems seem to be adapted to deal with that very well. And so maybe at the same time, they can deal with virus infections, uh, which is not to say they don't get sick. Bats certainly do get sick, but not uh, as often as you would expect from having all these viruses in them. So here are a couple of examples. Hendra virus, an outbreak in 1994 in Hendra, Australia, which is up here on the northeast coast. An outbreak on a horse, a racehorse farm. Uh, you know, racehorses are expensive, right? Cost, because they can win you a lot of money. So a good racehorse is very expensive. 14 racehorses die. And then the trainers are very close to the horses. They groom them, they ride them, so they get their viruses. So one trainer died. And so what happened here is that the, the horses are in open barns, and at night the, the flying foxes come in, and they excrete virus there, and they contaminate the horses and they get it. Uh, so flying foxes to horses and then to humans. And this is an ongoing problem uh, in this area. There are, there are cases uh, continuously occurring. It doesn't transmit from human to human, so it's, a, it's another zoonotic spillover. A and that map is the range of the flying fox, by the way. Uh, the, the line shows that. And so here on, on Australia, these are areas where there have been uh, Hendra virus outbreaks, and they're all vectored by the, the flying fox. And so one of the solutions to this is to vaccinate horses, because there's not enough human disease to warrant vaccinating humans, but there are a lot of horses that are targets. And so we vaccinate horses and we protect humans. So this is called a one health approach or one world health because the 
the implication is that we're all living together in this world, humans and non-human animals, so we share our viruses. So that vaccine um, can be used for horses, but interestingly, it's expensive, and the, many racehorse owners don't want to use it for some reason. I don't know, if I had a $100,000 horse, I'd, I'd cough up 500 bucks for a vaccine, I think. Anyway, the vaccine made for um, Hendra is a spike vaccine, just a spike protein. And it happens to protect against Nipah virus as well. Really cool. So Nipah virus is an outbreak uh, in 1998 in Malaysia. And this was an outbreak of respiratory and neurological disease on pig farms, starting up here in the Perak district of Malaysia. Uh, and then there was an outbreak further south. And then some of those pigs were shipped to Singapore. So there was an outbreak uh, in Singapore as well. 105 human deaths, because a lot of people take care of these pigs. A million pigs were culled. That means they were killed because they had to stop the infection. And you know, a million pigs, you can't take each one and break their skull or whatever. So they dug a big pit and pushed them all into it and buried them alive. It's really sad. You can find the video on YouTube if you look for it. I feel really bad for the pigs. It's a major source of protein, of course. The problem was the piggeries, which is where you raise the pigs, were outdoors. And so it, not only were they outdoors, but in the piggeries, they had planted uh, mango trees. Not mango trees. It's mango. I think it was mango trees. Yes, mangoes. And the bats at night used to come and eat the mangoes. And you know, someone told me once, the bats suck the juice out of the fruit and then they drop the rest. And of course the pigs, eat the rest because they'll eat anything and then they get infected. And that's what started this. And then humans get it from the pigs. Now, subsequently, this was stopped. The piggeries were put inside. So this is called biosecurity on pig farms. Put the pigs inside so the bats can't contaminate them. So no outdoor pig farms anymore. No outdoor piggeries. Uh, but now we have transmission of this virus by another route from date palm sap. So uh, date palm tree, people like to tap them and get the sap, it's tasty, and they also like to ferment it and make an alcoholic beverage. So there is a, one of these uh, date palm trees being tapped. The problem is that at night the bats go in and they like to drink the date palm sack and they pee in it at the same time and they put uh, Nipah virus there. So people get this from uh, drinking that. The low tech solution is to cover the pots Beautiful, it's like a screen on the window. You cover the pot, the bat can't get in, that stops the transmission. But there are still uh, infections that continue. Some of them are independent of date palm sap consumption. We don't know what they're, what they're associated with. So why did this virus suddenly in 1998, why did it suddenly start infecting pigs? Well, there were a number of events that happened. First, it was an El Nino a few years before that made drought. And so the natural habitat of the bat is being destroyed. Humans were clear cutting this forest because they wanted to make farms uh, to grow f crops. So they burned, slashed and burned the forest, cut them down and burned them. So you're destroying the bat habitat. Plus you're making a lot of haze in the form of smoke so the bats can't navigate any longer. And so you're reducing the food supply for the bats. So what do they do? They're not dumb, they migrate. They go somewhere else. They migrated to the pig farms where there were mango trees uh, and then they encountered pigs and they gave them their viruses. So this is our fault, okay? It's our fault because we're deforesting. Uh, the El Nino, not our fault I suppose, but uh, you combine all of that and it pushes the bats somewhere else. So you can always explain something. So that's the ecology here. We have uh, flying foxes foraging on fruit trees on pig farms, the pigs get infected, they infect humans. Then we have uh, flying foxes feeding from date palm sap collection pots. People consume that and they die. And then family members prepare the bodies for burial, and so they can transmit the virus amongst each other, close contact transmission. And then there are some uh, pay people who are uh, infected, and in some cases they have a contact with a horse, maybe the horse was infected by a bat, we're not quite sure. But these infections continue in uh, Bangladesh and in India, and so 
the uh, Handra virus vaccine is being tested to try and prevent those infections. Uh, and so hundreds of cases of people dying. This is something that warrants a vaccine. And uh, it took a nonprofit company called CEPI, C-E-P-I, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and, I don't know what the I stands for. Innovation, Innovation thank you. <laughs> CEPI, uh, whose CEO I, I interviewed in um, December 2019, actually really interesting. They raise money, they're a nonprofit, and they pay for phase one vaccine trials where no company wants to get involved because they're not gonna make a profit. And so they are putting um, the Hendra spike in a phase one for NEPA. So if, you know, if there's an outbreak, they can vaccinate people. And if there's a, world, a, a broader world outbreak, which is always possible with these Hendra and NEPA viruses, uh, we could be ready. This one I particularly like. This is Argentine hemorrhagic fear, Hunin virus. Uh, an RNA virus with uh, uh, ambisense RNA virus, a segmented genome. So after World War II in Argentina, they decided they wanna uh, plant maize to feed people. So they put herbicides down to get rid of all the weeds, they plant their maize. So you, all the original weeds are gone, the maize grows up, and then there's a lot of shade below the, the corn, right? A new kind of grass begins to grow there, which is able to grow in the shade. And that grass is eaten by a mouse that hadn't been there before because it's a new kind of grass. Calamus musculinus, that's the mouse up there. And then in 1953, suddenly there's a new hemorrhagic fever disease detected in people who are working in the, in the maize fields. And it's caused by a virus carried by this calamus mouse isolated in 1958, it's Argentine hemorrhagic fever. So another example of how we mess with things we screw up the ecology, we don't think, and we get virus infections as a consequence. Ebola viruses, another uh, spillover uh, caused disease. These have caused outbreaks since 1976, the first outbreaks in DRC, as you can see here, and then continuing to the present. The, the, the diameter of the circle shows you roughly the number of cases in each outbreak. And then of course, in uh, 2015, uh, in West Africa, huge numbers of cases, 25,000, the biggest ever, uh, with lots of fatalities. Mostly these uh, outbreaks are in Central uh, Africa, Uganda, DRC, Gabon, Sudan, uh, and so forth. But this one was in Western Africa. They weren't ready for it, and so it spread extensively before they could respond. Ebola viruses are negative strand uh, envelope viruses with a filamentous shape to them. So this is a classic zoonosis. The index case usually has contact with an animal carcass, you know, bushmeat uh, hunting. Uh, and then the infected person is usually cared for by a family or it goes to a hospital, transmits to other people in close contact. And eventually you find out what's going on and you can stop the chains of infection quite readily. So it never spreads uncontrollably. Um, here are two examples of uh, Ebola virus outbreaks in 1996, 37 cases in Gabon. A chimp found dead in the forest was taken by people that ate it. And 18 people who were butchering the chimp got sick and then 10 other in family members. That's a classic way that this gets started. Another one, 60 cases in Gabon, uh, the index case. The first case was a hunter who lived uh, in a forest camp and they found a dead chimp uh, in, near where he lived and it was infected with Ebola virus. So these are typical scenarios. Now in 2015, an, an outbreak began in uh, Western Africa, as I told you, uh, in Guinea, Sierra Leone, in Liberia. And this went on for months before it was recognized that it was Ebola because it never had be Ebola in this region. They thought it would be malaria or something else, but they did a lot of epidemiology, and I wanted to share this with you. So the first cases were this uh, this village here, Gekadu, and um, here in that uh, that area, there were nine deaths in, in December 2013 to 14. The first case was a two-year-old child who died after four days of black stool fever and vomiting. So we don't know where the child got the virus, may have been playing in the forest or something and acquired it, but then he, he gave it to his sister, his mother, grandmother, they all died. The nurse who took care of them, the village midwife 
She got infected, she didn't die. Oh yes, she died eventually, but before that she spread it to another village because the midwives are going to different villages and then it spreads onward and onward. And you can see they traced every single case in these first months of the outbreak. So it tells you how the close contact and caring for family members and so forth leads to the transmission. But this is a dead end infection. It does not become a sustained human virus. And you know, you may say, oh, well, 25,000 cases is a lot. Yes, but that's because people were in close contact not realizing it was Ebola virus. And if you're right next to someone, you can transmit it. But if you stop that, you can stop the chains of infection. Now, the, the related virus, Marburg virus, which also causes outbreaks of hemorrhagic fever, highly lethal hemorrhagic fever in humans, has been isolated from a fruit bat in Africa, so that's the reservoir. We have not isolated infectious Ebola virus from any bat. We've got RNA, we have antibodies, which is suggestive, but doesn't prove that that's the reservoir. So we think it's bats, and we think humans, gorillas, chimpanzees are dead-end hosts, so that's summarized here. So we have bats as reservoirs, they're passing Ebola virus amongst them without getting ill, and then they can pass the virus to chimps, to gorillas, and uh, to humans. So a classic zoonotic event. This virus, as I said, is transmitted by very close contact with blood, body fluids, as you can see here, many body fluids have virus in them, typically from people who have just died, you're being cared for in very close proximity, contaminated objects, needles and syringes, but not by insects, water, uh, food, and not by respiratory droplets. So the next one is SARS-1, the OG SARS, as some call it. And this is a post, I don't know if you guys remember um, chat rooms, but there used to be email chat rooms where people communicated. And so this was a, an email where someone said, I got this email uh, and, uh, an acquaintance of mine from a teacher's chat room lives there and reports that the hospitals have been closed and people are dying. So this is February of 2003. So this is a ProMed Mail post. The ProMed Mail is a wonderful website that tracks infectious disease outbreaks and other kinds of outbreaks as well. So February 2003, and China did not report it uh, to the world for quite a while. So uh, this began in November. So it wasn't until February 2003 that word of this is getting out outside of China. In November 2002, an outbreak of severe pneumonia in Guangdong, down there in the south of China, 300 cases, five deaths, severe atypical pneumonia, similar to what we see with uh, COVID-19, um, eventually leading to respiratory failure and 10 to 20% of the people needing uh, intubation. A Chinese doctor who took care of some of those early patients in Guangdong went to Hong Kong on February 21st of 2003. He stayed in this Metropole Hotel. He died the next day in the hospital, but he spread it to 10 other people in the hotel who then flew off to various countries and brought virus to those countries. Uh, and then eventually it spread to 8,000 people in 29 countries. And there's this travel poster here that I like to show. Hong Kong will take your breath away. Ah. Right? It's true. It really would. Anyway, um, this is the epi curve for SARS-1. Uh, again, um, beginning in November, but not being reported until later, uh, and peaking in March and then ending uh, in July. 8,000 cases, mainly uh, in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, not many in the US and other countries, as you can see. So we recognize this, and this is a virus that's not transmitted during the incubation period. The peak of shedding is at the peak of disease when people can be put in hospitals and you can do infection control. So that stopped, and it's, we haven't seen it since. But where did it come from? Uh, human sera collected for the, before the outbreak don't have antibodies to the virus. Uh, the earliest cases in Guangdong were in the handlers of animals for the exotic food market where they sell animals uh, outdoors, as you can see, and there's lots of opportunity for infection. Those animals, traders had antibodies uh, to the virus. Subsequently, in the next 10 years, they looked around in the countryside into bats. They found 
SARS-related coronavirus in various bats. And in one cave in Yunnan province, they found uh, bat coronaviruses with the right sequences, if they recombine, could form SARS-CoV-1. So they didn't have a single virus that was the ancestor of SARS-CoV-1, but they had a couple which, if recombined, could make it. Now, there were no cases in Yunnan province during the outbreak. So this is these bats were from a cave in Yunnan province. The cases were in the city. So the idea is that people didn't get infected in, the, in Yunnan, but rather the bats infected another animal and the animal was brought to the market uh, and then that infected people. And in fact, civet cats were one species that were uh, implicated uh, in being infected in the countryside, being brought in infected, and then as they are being handled uh, for sale, they infect the people. MERS coronavirus, another epidemic coronavirus emerged 2012. It was a case of uh, fatal pneumonia in a 60-year-old male patient. The virus was recovered. Genome sequence turned out to be a coronavirus, a new coronavirus, not related, not SARS-1, but something new. Um, and the idea being that this came from bats, but it didn't go directly from bats to people. The people get this infection from dromedary camels, or the, the, the camels with the hump there, one hump. And um, camels are, in, are endemic for this virus, MERS-CoV, in, in the Middle East and Africa. Um, and so humans who have contact with camels can pick up the infection. Camels are numerous in this region. They're used for as beasts of burden. They're used as pets. Uh, they're used for meat. So there are lots of camels there. When camels are born, they're, they're in a flock or a herd. They get infected, and they can spread the infection to any humans that are near them. It doesn't spread well from human to human. Uh, and the way to deal with this is to make a vaccine for camels because there are not so many human cases. So just like Hendra, you vaccinate the source. And so this is the epi curve for uh, MERS coronavirus. Uh, most of the cases are in the Middle East, shown in green and red. A few cases get exported. Korea had the biggest outbreak in the hospital. A man went there from the Middle East. He got sick. He was obviously incubating the virus. He went to a hospital. They didn't know what he had, so they didn't put him in an infection containment ward, and he infected a bunch of other people before they realized uh, what was going on. But it's not sustained outside of the Middle East, which is where the camels are. So the camels transmit it to each other. The camels transmit it to humans. They're short chains uh, of infections among humans. Uh, and these infections are still occurring. So uh, that's why we'd like to make a camel vaccine to take a one world uh, approach to this. So yes, 2,468 cases uh, since 2012. Is it 2012? Yes, 2012. And 27 countries and uh, 851 deaths. All right, camels. So camels probably got it from bats at some point maybe a few hundred years ago. And that brings us to SARS-CoV-2, the third pandemic of the 21st century. So we have the 2009 influenza virus pandemic. We have the ongoing HIV AIDS pandemic. So this is the third pandemic. Begins in Wuhan, China, which is north of Guangzhou, as we, as we saw for SARS-1. Uh, with a cluster of pneumonia cases of unknown cause, December 2019. And the subsequent epidemiological analysis shows very clearly that uh, a open air market in Wuhan called the Huanan Seafood Market, which also sells uh, mammals, is the epicenter of the early uh, infection. And so here's a map of that part of Wuhan so here's the Huanan market right there. And you can see these, these dots are cases. The, the green are cases linked to the Huanan market, you know, people who either uh, visited or work there. And the, uh, the others uh, have home addresses. Sorry, the, the green are no identified link to the market, but they're clustering around it. And the red are cases with some kind of link to the market. And uh, here is the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is blamed often as being the site of the leak of this virus, but there's no 
epicenter around uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and it's across the river uh, from the, uh, the seafood market. And we'll, next time, we will talk more about the evidence uh, that this was the, the beginning of this infection coming from some mammal sold in the market that was contaminated in the countryside by a bat uh, that went into people. No bats were being sold at this market. No pangolins, which you may have heard, uh, can harbor similar viruses. But raccoon dogs and civet cats, which are known to be uh, infected, were sold there. As I said, next time we'll look at this uh, in more detail. But this virus clearly came uh, from the market, not from a laboratory. In fact, all of the human coronaviruses came from nature. So we have talked about SARS-1 that came from bats via civets into people, very clear. MERS coronavirus, bats, camels, people. And these do not, uh, the SARS-1 had you know, 8,000 infections, but we were able to stop it. Didn't have that community transmission. MERS coronavirus, uh, short, very short chains of transmission, if any. There is a coronavirus of pigs that emerged uh, a number of years ago in China called Severe Acute Diarrhea Syndrome Coronavirus, SADS coronavirus. It's caused an outbreak in Chinese pig farms, very agriculturally, very serious. And that came from a bat contaminating the pigs uh, with a coronavirus. Then we have SARS-CoV-2. All the evidence, which I'll show you next time, indicates that uh, bats harbor the closest viruses to SARS-CoV-2. And then we have four human common cold coronaviruses. These give you colds every winter. You all get them for sure over and over again. They're very mild. And analysis shows that they all came from uh, animals. NL63, certainly from bats. We don't know if there was an intermediate. Uh, 229E from bats via an intermediate animal. OC43 from rodents through cows. Uh, and HKU1 also from rodents. So the pattern here is that all of these coronaviruses come from animals into humans. So why do you ignore this when you say SARS-CoV-2 came from a lab? Why would you ignore history that we know all of the coronaviruses came from nature? In fact, every virus comes from some other host. There's only one I can think of that came from a lab, and that's the 1977 influenza pandemic originated as a vaccine trial. It was purposefully put into people and somehow it got away. And so that's not really a lab leak, that's a vaccine issue. But I don't know any other example of viruses emerging uh, from labs to cause uh, epidemics or pandemics. Which is not to say that it can't happen, right? But you look for the evidence. I'll give you that evidence next time. Anyway, the, a lot of these viruses that we've been talking about, if you want to work on them, you need high containment, which is BSL-4. That's me in a BSL-4 suit. Uh, it's a really heavy duty plastic suit that um, is all zipped up and it's airtight. You, you have to put an air hose in it to breathe, as you can see. You have, uh, you have double gloves and tape around your arms. You wear boots. And when you walk around the room, you, you clip and unclip your air hose. There are a bunch of these hoses all over the room. We actually got to do a documentary in, these, in this BSL-4 in Boston called The Needle. And you can see how, uh, how hard it is to work there. But these are viruses that have high mortality. They go person to person. And there's no approved vaccines or antivirals like Ebola viruses uh, and Lassa viruses and, and many others. SARS-CoV-2 is not a BSL-4. It's a BSL-3, which is one level less where you don't have to have oxygen or air pumped into your suit, but you do have a, a respirator and you, you have to work in certain ways. But these, these four labs, uh, they're sealed. You cannot get into them except through a, a certain door. You have to have high training to get in. When you're done at the end of the day, you go out through a shower. You, put, you go into the shower with the suit. It showers on you for X number of minutes with a disinfectant. Uh, and then you go out and take it off. So very, very carefully restricted. So just in ending up here, how common are these jumps from animals to humans? They're very common, but many, most of them don't produce any sustaining transmission. No, we can't predict them. 
but we could be ready by knowing how many viruses are out there. Uh, and I think we could also be ready by establishing screenings areas in centers of high human traffic, airports, bus stations, ports, and so forth. And some people are trying to get that uh, going. We could also make pan coronavirus antivirals because it's likely that at some point there'll be another spillover of a coronavirus. We could have been ready for this one, but we weren't because nobody wants to pay for these. We could certainly make pan corona antivirals. We have flu antivirals that work in the case of, a, of an outbreak. So there's really no reason to have this happen again, except that uh, people don't want to spend money on an infection that's not there. And that's really a bad reason. So next time we're going to talk about two pandemics, HIV AIDS and COVID-19 in a little more detail.